I want to talk a bit about some perspectives and some prospects and how you think they relate to, you know, because we've been, the theme of, I think, kind of what we've been talking about is the relationship between all of these struggles, that it's not just one struggle, we're, we're all in it together for, for something, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, things like that. I wanted to know what you thought about the, the consequences of the defeat of the provisional campaign in Ireland towards the general anti-imperialist struggle and what you think uh, that says to future generations of people who would like to continue the struggle. We could separate those two questions if you'd like. The defeat, the defeat of the... What do you think the defeat of the provisional campaign? I think it, we can't. It has to be a defeat. Yes. Uh, I mean, if the, if the British Army is on the streets with the guns and the IRA is giving them away, clearly somebody's lost and somebody's won. And how do you feel that plays out in general towards an anti-imperialist struggle? Well, <coughs> the thing about it is you could only um, say, given guns away that was bought here to send to Ireland to get the Brits out, given them back to the enemy. Is uh, is an outrage. It's treachery. It's treachery. Yes. In the old days, anybody that would give a gun away or something like that, you were called to account for it. I'm not saying that was a good policy, but I'm saying that's what it was. It was called to uh, to uh, to account for it. You, know? you were killed. Yes. You, uh, and then. Um, Furthermore, if you had a dump and didn't take care of the stuff or something like that, and uh, the old timers wouldn't stand for that, you know. I remember when uh, <clears throat> when I was called in and laughed at the running messages for them for a few years, and told me that there's work to be done. If you want to do it, come in. If you don't, don't expect anybody to say thank you. That was it. Well, that was them hard men, but in other words, they, they didn't, uh, their forebears for them, not to, not to expect thank you or pats on the back, you know. But uh, my uh, general view, like in unions or anything, once people change, they don't stop. Mm -hmm. They go galloping them in the other direction, you know. Take, for instance, Martin McGuinness, Jerry Adams, and they were coming to the likes of not only me, but people like me all over, and getting their plain food and all this, that, and the other. Well, getting their clothes washed or something, and able to take a shower or whatever, you know, be on the way. Well, when they start living luxuriously, you know, I might want to go back to that again, you know. No, I think they all have houses now in, what, Cyprus, is it? Or somewhere in the Mediterranean. Somewhere. Yeah, they all have dachas down there somewhere. If... Uh, do you, how important do you think it is for the Republican struggle and the Republican movement in this country, or in any other country, to be openly socialist, to be openly challenging capitalism and not just imperialism. Well, it's um, it's very important, I think. Connolly bought a place for us, see, with his life blood. He brought the labor movement into the vanguard, and he bought a place for us. Uh, you know, he brought the, the labor movement into the into the vanguard. In his absence, then uh, that went by, uh, you know, in 1980. But he bought a place for us with his life's blood, and and uh, I have no difficulty in saying that uh, that uh, I'm a follower, but I'm that is, I'm a socialist like James Conley. I'm not afraid of that word, you know. And if uh, goes down to push against shove, I'm not uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a communist, you know. Whether I am or not, if, if working uh, stood for the, against the imperialism and racism, and that makes me a communist, then I'm a communist. And that's it, you know. McRae will go for that one. <laughs> <laughs> what, but on a practical level, uh, how, do you th how do you think, for example, uh, what I always thought was what made republicanism revolutionary was the idea that it was to break 
it, it saw unionism as an ideology to break Protestant workers from, rather than an ethnic identity to bargain with. It, Republicanism was not a nationalist ideology, it was a political movement. And in the context of that, how important is it to retain socialism, to win to your side your enemy? Well, uh, the thing about his history, uh, yeah. Take, for instance, 1916, when Connolly united with some of the more conservative people and all this, that, and the other, and he was condemned by some of the extreme left for that, you know. Of course, uh, Lenin, I think, put it uh, clearly. He said, if you're waiting for him, for a purely socialist army and a purely imperialist army to face each other, this is your way forever. So, you know, and... Uh, and he wrote that about 1916. Something like right yeah. after, you know, the... Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm awful, always sorry that Connolly and uh, Lennon never met. But I... Because they had a lot in common from what I read, you know. Of them, you know, but uh, I think it was uh, the main thing. It was harder to travel then. And there was no telephones or anything like that then. But then, uh, I would say that they fought, you know, there was a lot of similarities, you know. So it wasn't just Irish socialists that influenced you, but it was socialists from other countries. That oh, influenced yes, you. I mean, yes, uh, it would be, yeah. But in other words, uh, uh, the basic, uh, the basic thing about it is that uh, Connolly was, uh, and in fact you could say that probably uh, all of our people, like Tone, Laurel, and all that, they uh, they were in the forces of progress, you know, and uh, Connolly more or less followed through with that, you know, and. Uh, Marx and Engels they were always very favorable to us, uh, the Irish call. They were great lovers of Ireland. Very great lovers. And I think one, uh, Jennifer Marx, I think, she was, uh, I think, sarcastically, she said one thing, something about Rome. She says, we have no friends in the eternal city. <laughs> <laughs> Marx used to teach the neighborhood uh, children Irish rebel songs to... Used to. Yeah, and he used to teach in his old neighborhood, he used to teach the neighborhood children Irish rebel songs to make their parents mad. No the kidding. English kids, yeah, in his neighborhood. <laughs> so they'd go home from Marx's house singing about the Manchester martyrs and stuff like that. They were great lovers of Ireland. Poshy men, too. I was reading about him not so long ago. He was in a dishwasher and something when McSweeney died, I think, and he cried bitterly, you know. Ho Chi Minh cried at McSweeney died. Bitterly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, men he mentioned McSweeney many times as, a, as somebody he looked up to. Hmm? Uh, Ho Chi Minh mentioned uh, McSweeney many times as somebody he looked up to. Yes. As a, uh, mm -hmm. as a martyr. But what galled me was, and the all saying that Thatcher was just as strong as Bobby Sands. <laughs> it's nice to be strong when you have your belly full. Yeah. You, when you're dying. On, uh, you know, history has moved on, but it hasn't changed too dramatically. We're now in a war in Iraq. Uh, I wonder how you feel about the war in Iraq. Oh, I suppose if we didn't go in there for a moment. To bring democracy in there for black gold. Oil. 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 And it is, it's not surprising to you then that there would be resistance in Iraq? It's not a, it's not a, a an army of occupation. They're always going to be sniped at by the people they occupy. That's nature, too. That's nature. And the worst times with us when we were ground down. You always have somebody, the old wild rapparees, who would take a shot, you know. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with this. And the thing about it is, you know, now with so, it's these huge tanks that we have, and these guns, and all this, that, and the other, and all this, that, and the other. But uh, they're targets too, you know. It, uh, 
It's a very asymmetrical type of conflict. It's very yes. hard to fight that kind of conflict. Uh, somebody said to me, well, uh, you're not for a disarmament? I said, I am not for disarmament. I am for disarmament. But I want them to show us the way. I said, not only just weaponry, I said, they, nuclear, they have enough nuclear bombs to destroy the world. I said, let them start there. Let them start there. And let them not go destroying them down in Puerto Rico or something. Let them find their, I said, let them find a, a way to do it. They can, uh, if they can find a way to do that, maybe they'll find a way to cure cancer. <laughs> So, you you think it's pretty natural that there would be a, a resistance movement in Iraq? Oh, That's definitely. Not, not no question. And if they, might, they might be overfull and what why in Bush. I mean, when you see the likes of Bush are sending and going to Iraq, but he doesn't belong there. Let's see. And how do you feel about Jerry Adams meeting George Bush and shaking his hand? Well, it's something that I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> something that I wouldn't do. <laughs> Do you have any advice for Jerry Adams? Well, and there was, uh, he went through a lot. I think myself, if I was to advise Jerry, uh, Jerry, I think he has a wife and family. He'd enjoy his retirement. <laughs> I don't think he's going to retire. No, no, no. Unfortunately. Well, getting back to conflicts like Iraq, what, what do you think the what do you think the way forward is? How do we? How? I think that um, I think that's one way. Just offhand, um, I have uh, two people I respect very much: as Frank Tuck and Jimmy Breslin. I think the thing in, first off would be to give it back to the UN. You know. Back to the UN. Yes. Maybe they can let us declare victory and then turn it back to the UN. You know. Wouldn't you rather see the Iraqis declare victory and do it themselves? Uh, well, if these, if these, uh, uh, I, I prefer the Iraqis to to to, to be victorious, but uh, uh, when they're not, uh, if they want to, if the powers that be wants to be heroes, let them, let Condoleezza Rice and everything, let them take, let them take credit and then give it back to the UN. You know. She's a very smart woman, but smart the wrong way. Smart the wrong way. They often are. I think, uh, I think what it was, she, you know, uh, African people were supposed to be always like kind of uh, leftish or something like that. But she saw there was a better future for her right being a rightist, you know. It's like the way that bum who, who condemned the Rosenbergs to death, you know, Hoffman, you know. Oh, yeah. And there was he... Uh, he, uh, that time, that those years, you know, the Jewish people were supposed to be pretty left, you know. And he was going to make sure that they weren't, you know. I have a great time for uh, the Rosenberg sons. Yes. Um, David uh, and Robert Neopold. That's right, the And uh, uh, I was at something, and... Who was there too but one of their daughters, you know, fine young woman, you know, and uh, she was on here uh, something, oh, somewhere, so, um, Sam Roberts or somebody, one of those nights, you know, a fine young woman, you know, but it's, uh, it's a remarkable thing how those two fellas, uh, Robert and Michael Mirpo, you know, how they try to poison them against their family, against their parents, you know. And how they beat them, you know. They beat them. They do. And radicalized them in the process is what they ended up doing. Mm -hmm. They ended up radicalizing the Mirapol oh, brothers yes. in the process. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's Robert that's come out with the last book. He's very intense, right. you know. Well, before we... Uh, talk a little bit about the Good Friday Agreement, because I would like to get your take on the Good Friday Agreement. I uh, want to talk about uh, if there's any if there's any elements of the story up to now that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about. Well, uh, in other words, uh, the thing about it is uh, 
They have tried everything in Ireland except one, the Bristol Eve. They have tried everything. That's the, that's the problem it has been since they came here in 800 years ago, whenever the hell it was, you know. So that will be to such time as they leave. And that is, uh, there can be no ceasefire or there can be no giving weapons away. They can, uh, it's up to the people in Ireland to uh, increase or decrease the, you know, to uh, activity. But uh, giving guns away, that's treachery. And do you think with the Brits out of Ireland, do you think an accommodation can be made with Protestant workers? Well, uh, we're all talking about something that would be a bloodbath in Africa. The guy called Dick Clark came along, you know. And I thought that uh, Blair would have the uh, guts to do what he did, but he didn't take. He had the power, you know. He wouldn't, uh, you know, to set a date or withdraw, you know. But that had come. Uh, you won't always have a, you won't always have a bush in the White House. You'll have uh, somebody there someday, and the Brits will ask him, "We're in trouble." Well, I'm in trouble too, because I'm getting. <laughs> it's your problem now, you know. Yeah. So you better get moving. Uh, where do you see the? Where do you see things going in in Ireland? In terms of where, where do you th where do you see things going in Ireland, both north and south? And where do you see things going in Ireland, both north and south? Do you well, know? in other words, uh, I would say when the Brits decide to leave and all that, they'll, they'll sit down and they'll uh, I'll, uh, give you an instance of that. Here, three or four years ago, uh, there was something on about the famine, you know, and we brought uh, some. Um, some uh, Protestant people, Orange people, whatever you call them, you know, or who had suffered with the famine too, you know. Well, anyways, uh, we all had uh, dinner up in Huey O'Lunnies. But I got there early, and this lady got there early too, and uh, she had done time for the wrong reason, but anyways, and uh, she had a couple of children then, and her husband wasn't with her, but anyways, uh, we sat down together and was having a cup of tea or something till the everybody came in. You know what, George? She says, I was never this close to a shinner before. And she says, you're just like we are. <laughs> but she says, a shinner. I was never this close to a shinner. I says, what do you think I do? It reminded me of uh, here during the Cold War, this, um, this uh, uh, Russian diplomat or something came here and he took his wife and kids out for a walk in uh, Central Park and one of the kids says, Daddy, he says, those people are just like we are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They're just the same as we are. We have a common humanity. Yes. And the Good Friday Agreement, is it a step towards a united Ireland or a step away from a united Ireland? Well, it's only uh, like a stepping stone again and it's buying time for them, but uh, uh, to try to finalize it, and not only that, Adam wants to just end the IRA or when they do that. Uh, I don't know how he thinks he can do that, because uh, it matters little about the likes of me. I'm close to 90, and the longest can't be long. But there have been, been new ones come up. Uh, there are young people out there who are who are uh, not going to take one step at a time, you know. Because uh, you can go on for another thousand years that way. Because every time they're, you know, whatever. <coughs> George, in this context of the Good Friday Agreement and and the the betrayals, the treachery, as you said, of uh, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness. Uh, what do you think the difference is between waging a war and fighting for a revolution? <coughs> waging a war? And fighting for a revolution. Well, uh, if you're waging a war and trying to occupy another country, that's imperialism. 
Mm-hmm. If you're uh, fighting for a revolution, <coughs> you're trying to to overthrow imperialism. But in the context of Ireland, where uh, the leadership of the provisionals felt that they were fighting a war, and people like Bobby Sands would have said that they were revolutionaries, I don't think Jerry Adams would call himself a revolutionary anymore, or Martin McGuinness, or any of them. In that context, what well, do you think? Well, Martin McGuinness has said, Jerry Adams has said he never was in the IRA. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus, I have trouble with that. <laughs> You know that's not the case, huh? Some uh, old timer called me up from our uh, from uh, um, great friends of Thorin and her husband. She was a northern actress. She says, oh, I have a problem with that, George. She says, but he never was in the. I have a problem with that. I says, well, I have another. I have a bigger blood problem. <coughs> In other words, there are people on, on the left, with the revolutionary left in, in Ireland and America, who would say that um, getting the Brits out of Ireland and overturning capitalism, overturning imperialism in, in Ireland are one and the same struggle that the, the provisionals have been saying for a number of years, let's get the Brits out, then we'll deal with socialism, and then we'll, you know, we'll deal with the working republic. But there are, there are people who say that part of the, the, the reason why we're in the state we're in is that... Uh, it, you can't divorce those struggles. It's one and the same struggle. <coughs> well, in other words, like I said, uh, the people <coughs> in my life, man, that I work with, get the way with all, we're all socials. Yeah. In other words, there was no difference there, you know. A uh, few people along the we few times dropped out of this, we'll uh, get socialism first. And I says, Connor didn't see it that well. You know? So you found you found that the most consistent people in the Republican movement were also the, on the left? Hmm? You, have you found that the most consistent people in the Republican movement were socialists and on the uh, left? On the left, yes. yes. The most, uh, yes. The I'm not saying that the one people, conservative people who gave money and all sure. this, that and the other. Sure. But the most, in my opinion, the most consistent people were people on the left. Yes. Yeah. After all, uh, it's all coming out of Ireland uh, was England's first colony, you know. Um, she's not going to leave there in a hurry. Furthermore, I have great hopes as... Uh, you do have hope. I definitely, definitely. I have no doubt in the world that they'll go. <coughs> and probably uh, you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, people in Scotland, Wales, and uh, there was, in fact, there's movements there now, and all oh, this, that, and the other, and Cornwall. Cornwall. So, uh, the Scottish Socialist Party is making great strides, uh, and they're a socialist party for an independent Scotland. Yes. And they're making great strides while the Scottish Nationalist Party is losing and losing and losing because they are, they're taming their nationalism and also their radicalism. It's interesting to see that in, even in the wake of... Do you need to change that? Yeah, sorry. All right. The piece of grace of one of this thing is to... It's to, uh, it's to, uh, to uh, and, and don't push and could push. You see, he's uh, <clears throat> and his cohorts and the want imperialism, they want them, this country to be a big guilty empire. You know. Well, uh, me, I want to keep it the way the founders wanted it to be, the land of the free and the home of the brave. You know. <clears throat> and I think we're going to, I think we're going to, uh, to make it. Be easy, can't lit up, but I think we're going to, uh, I think we're going to dump this guy. You're going to dump Bush. I think so. Yes, I'm. I'm quantum. In fact, he uh, he stole the last election on this, you know. And Do you think Kerry will be honest? What well, the only thing about it is he has to be better than the of toast and to keep him honest. Mm-hmm. And in Ireland, do you have advice? Mm-hmm. Do you have advice for the young people in Ireland? Do you have advice for the young people well, in the United I have States? Advice to uh, hold on to their guns, 
because that's the way we'll ever, that's the only uh, way we'll ever achieve our, achieve our independence and to spread out and get all the, all the support they can too, you know, the rank and file support. And what about young people in the United States? After Seattle demonstrations and the big anti-war demonstrations, what would you tell them? To continue to do first thing is to dump Bush, take the neck and step forward then and to, uh, to uh, keep them honest, you know. Keep, hold on to social security, education for the young, care for the old, the whatever, you know, and uh, housing needs. We shouldn't have homeless people in this country. If you can spend uh, billions and billions in, we, we shouldn't have homeless people here. You know. Billions for war and nothing Billions, for yeah. I didn't think there was this kind of money. I didn't know there was. I don't know where it comes from. Apparently it comes from me and you. <laughs> the only thing about uh, us like this, and <clears throat> with all their money and all this, and all socialists one time, the our old union used to say the one thing Harrison he says the multi billionaires all they can do is eat one meal at a time. <laughs> Take one drink at a time. Yeah. And he says and he says then furthermore he says, they don't enjoy it as much as we do. <laughs> and they don't take it with them either. No, they can't take it with them. They can't take it with them. And uh, there's one thing about it is uh, one thing about the assurer is death, as well as taxes, you know. But George, your legacy is uh, irreplaceable, and uh, their money is completely replaceable. So I think that uh, I would very much like uh, uh, this interview to be read and looked at by young people thinking about their lives oh, and struggle. Do it or don't. I don't want to see any editing. You do it the way you want to do it. <laughs> okay. You have a free hand. And uh, the only thing about it is uh, Tom McCartney that of all things he should write a booklet, you know. He should write a booklet. Yeah, on his fan because on otherwise he'd be lost, you know. Yes. Just a small, not... On his family. Well, George, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we end the interview? No, I would say that... Uh, I would say that... Pressy! Make sure this fine lady. <laughs> There's one thing about us: uh, she has a grandson, Naheem, and I hear them go at it. You know, you've got the last games for me, but he always gets it the next day. <laughs> she has five daughters. She argues with them, but you know, anybody says anything, she's like a lioness. You know. <laughs> but when she came to me first, uh, she lost her way. She thought she was going to get a, a, a cranky old Irish woman with a jealous wife and all this, that, and the other. But here she is, you know. She's all kinds of surgery. I, uh, when you wasn't pain that time, I wasn't able to bear the pain for you. No, I went, I went in the hospital for a week, and George was there every day with a suit on with a different color robe <sighs> at 12 o'clock, every day. So the nurse said, that must be your lover. I said, that's my patient. <laughs> that's my patient. And he was so concerned. He's, I mean, the sweetest man I could ever have met. I would never give nothing for meeting him. He, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. What is meeting, what is it, what is meeting George meant to you? Well, it has changed my life in a, a, a lot of different ways. I've become more humble to people. I've become more um, patient. I've become more tolerant. I've become more not to make people unhappy. And I've become more to understand the fight, the struggle of the other countries, of Castro, when I saw, saw him at the, I really understood him. But, I, but by me hearing things about him, he was the worst man I had, but when I've heard him speak for myself, he just wants the best for people. He's not, he don't really want to uh, maintain anybody or keep anybody closed in because he was willing to send about 30 kids from here to come or come over there and become doctors and lawyers and come back and all they had to do is work in their community that's all he asked of them so how can that person have such a bad heart he can't he really can't 
And by meeting George, when we were struggling as black people, I really thought that we were struggling alone. But this man was struggling with us every step of the way. You know, I found check stubs where he went to causes way back, way back. And I said, you know, George, I said, you make me very proud. I said, because when I thought we was fighting by ourselves, he, you was fighting with us. And then he would say how when he was bartending, the black people would come in and they would say, you don't have to deal with them. He said, he, you know, he found out that he could learn a lot from us, just like we could, I learned a lot from him. We learn a lot from each other. His, he is our family, my family now. My kids call him grandfather. We have Thanksgiving here. We have Christmas here. My daughter here, she stays with him. She stayed with him until I got a home. She stayed right here. And anybody comes here, stay right here with George. And they be welcome. And we take care of them. I take care of them, you know? Because George deserves the best because he's given nothing but the best. He has given nothing but the best. And whatever he has done, it's been his best. It's been his from his heart. And he put all in all into it. So now I'm trying to give it back to him the best way I know how. George is an example of uh, sacrifice and commitment. To yes. To many generations. Yes. So I just I feel that he deserves the best, and that's what I'm trying to do. Give him the best, no matter what he wants. I'm trying to be there for him, whatever he wants to do, whatever he wants. I'm here, and I'll be here to, to eternity. I'm not going anywhere. You know, if I gave up my other job, but I was here, I was supposed to only be here four hours. I told him I wasn't going anywhere. So I'm here and I'll be here for eternity. Because I want, can't nobody give him the best like I do because I understand him. He called me in the middle of the night, I get in the cab and I come. I want him to know that I'm always available to him for whatever he wants, you know. Somebody there a few years ago, but when he told you to get that old cripple out of the way. Oh yeah, when I had him up. I mean, George, would just, George just stopped going out after the world trade. George was going to Manhattan by himself. I come look for George, and George be coming around the block, and I be coming up the block. You know, so until the World Trade thing, that really set him back. It really did because the place that he was going moved further away. And one day he went in the subway without me and fell in the subway. So it just that his he had paid his dues. It's time for him to sit back. Now.